having me and the organizers. Thank you so much. Um, you know, normally when I do these talks, I start with uh, a good anecdote and a sting operation that uh, is particularly absurd, but I don't think I need to do that given that you just saw this video. Um, but what I'd like to do is really add what I think is missing from a lot of the coverage of this issue, um, which is the context in which these cases um, are, are, are found, and also the response of the FBI, and what's going on within the FBI that makes these cases attractive. And so my book grew out of a, a story I wrote from, for Mother Jones Magazine, which itself grew out of a, uh, a year I spent at the uh, investigative reporting program at UC Berkeley. And, and during that year, I wanted to try to find I tried to look at how many cases the government had prosecuted since 9-11. And my tenure was ending uh, basically on the, end, the 10th anniversary of 9-11. So I wanted to take a 10-year look at terrorism cases that the federal government had prosecuted and, and look very closely at whether these cases involved what I would consider real terrorists. Someone who was connected to an international terrorist group, had the capacity to commit an act of terrorism, you know, actually had the bomb, so to speak. And then how many of them were like these men who were interested in committing some sort of act of violence, um, had no means on their own of committing that act of violence, and an FBI informant or undercover agent provided everything he needed, in some cases the idea, in every case the transportation and the bomb itself. And an early stumbling block I had, um, so I, I got interested in this in, in 2008, and the problem was, well, how do you define a terrorism case? And um, if, if you did like a data analysis of terrorism cases at the time, you would basically be kind of like drawing them out and saying, well, that's a terrorism case and that's a terrorism case. And, and the government could always come back to you and say, well, the, the, the cases you labeled as terrorism cases aren't terrorism cases, so your analysis is flawed. And, um, but then something extraordinary happened, which was that the government decided they wanted to prosecute Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the alleged 9-11 monster mind in New York instead of Guantanamo. As you all know, they, they since scuttled that plan, but the Congress at the time, and this was 2008, 2009, really pushed back and said, you know, I don't think this is a good idea. We shouldn't prosecute KSM in New York. What about security concerns? And Eric Holder went to Congress and delivered this list of cases. These nearly 500 defendants of the federal government for the first time said, these are the men that we prosecuted, and women, I should say, are the, the people we prosecuted on international terrorism charges since 9-11. And they laid out, um, you know, the criteria by which they defined a terrorism case. You know, some, you know, some terrorism cases by the U.S. government were things that are obviously terrorism cases you know, hijacking an airplane or using a weapon of mass destruction. And then there was this other category, which if the government could charge you with just about anything, like an immigration violation or lying to the FBI, and that was a terrorism case as long as there was some kind of tangential link to terrorism in some way that could be something perhaps as simple as watching a jihadi video or emailing or trying to email someone who was connected to an international terrorist group. And so I had this list of nearly 500 cases, and I had a year at Berkeley and a research assistant to go through every one of them. And so we went through every single one, thousands of pages of court, file, court records, and what we wanted to determine and what we did was build a database that laid out these cases, that laid out was an informant used, was the defendant connected to any terrorist, terrorist organization, um, did he have the capacity to commit a crime, uh, a terrorist act, and then if an informant was used, the role of that informant, did the informant provide um, information like you think of an informant, the role of an informant, or did he act as an agent provocateur? And what was incredibly extraordinary, and I want to say, preface this by saying that um, this is data that we provided to the DOJ after we were done, this is data we published, this is data that organizations like NPR have used, and the DOJ has not refuted any of this. And what we found is that of the 500 cases, we can throw out about half of them for being things that you wouldn't really consider terrorism. These are you know, men charged with immigration violations, with lying to the FBI, and their connections to terrorism aren't necessarily public, but the, the government labeled them as terrorists. But they, they were not in any way involved in a terrorist plot. And then, so okay, let's, let's drill down and say, okay, how many of them were actually dangerous? And if you look at it generously, of the 500 cases, really only about five were. You know, there was Faj Shahzad, for example. He's the man that delivered the bomb to Times Square. Uh, Fortunately, didn't go off. There was a, a man named Najibul Azazi who had connections to overseas terrorists and tried to <laughs> attack the New York City subway system, which fortunately was thwarted. And there's men like Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, um, the so-called underwear bomber. But taken generously, there's five cases that we can point out and say this was a dangerous guy. On the other hand, there are 150 men in the decade after 9-11 who were like the ones you just saw, um, James Cromedy, uh, the Duca brothers, who for whatever reason, aspired to commit 
an act of terrorism, whether it was they were ideologically committed to it, or they were lured into it by an informant, or they maybe didn't even know they were involved in a plot so much, like in the case of Yassin Aref. There were 150 of, of those cases. And so since then, you know, it's now 12 years since 9-11, and then a year and a half since my original study, we now have about 175 defendants who are like these men, and we still have that five who were the truly dangerous ones. And, and, the re and so, so, so then as part of this, I, I traveled all around the country and I met with current and former FBI agents, and you're probably not going to be surprised to hear that James Weddick is actually a minority voice among these, these current and former agents. And so I asked them, like, well, why did you go after James Crumpy? Why did you go after, you know, there was a case here in, in Tampa involving a man named Sammy Osmondash. Why did you go after these men who, you know, didn't have the capability to commit an act of terrorism? And, and what the FBI believes is that as a result of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the, the threat of al-Qaeda international terrorism is not what we saw in 9-11. It's not the prospect of an international group bringing from overseas a well-trained group who you know, have the capacity to build a weapon and will deliver it. I, instead, what they fear is that, that al-Qaeda and its affiliates have moved to, what, moved to what they consider a franchise model. So they put information online and they try to inspire people already living in the United States, perhaps already living in Europe, to commit acts of violence that they might not necessarily have, um, have any part in, but then Al-Qaeda could later raise its hand and say, look, you know, this is, you know, we, we played a role in that. And, and, and the main case that the FBI cites is Nadal Hassan, the man who um, took, our, took up arms and killed people at a middle, military base. He was communicating with Ayman al-Zawakri, the Al-Qaeda propagandist who was killed in the drone strike a couple of years ago. And they, they say, well, that's, that's the threat, that, that someone here you know, doesn't have specific connections to Al-Qaeda and will you know, get inspired and go commit an act of violence. And these sting operations that, that they're using are meant to find the terrorists of tomorrow today, so to find them before they go and strike. And, and so that's the theory, and, it, and it's a good one, right? I mean, it could happen. Like, it could be that there's someone in the United States who wants to commit an act of violence, doesn't have the means, and Al Qaeda is going to turn around a dark corner with an agent and say, here's a bomb, and they're going to go deliver that bomb. But the problem is that that's never happened. So you know, the FBI is prosecuting these cases and investigating these cases with informants to try to prevent a threat that really has never come to fruition. The closest that it's come has been Hassan, who had access to weapons um, and was just communicating with Ayman al Zawahri, whereas most of the people caught in these sting operations are like the Newburgh Four, where they're economically desperate, they are in some cases mentally ill, and an FBI informant is then paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to find, find terrorists. And, and they find these men on the fringes of Muslim communities who are mentally ill, economically desperate, and lure them into plots where they, you know, you know, if you read an affidavit now involving a terrorism sting, I, li I, like to, I liken it often to like the Mad Libs I played as a kid, you know, there, there, it's a story, there's blanks, and you just fill in the blanks. Well, that's pretty much an affidavit for an FBI terrorism sting, you know, it's just a matter of where you slot in the role of the informant and what bomb he delivered, but usually the, it's, it's evolved to the point now where it's pretty much something as simple as like they find a guy online who um, says, for example, maybe something vaguely um, extremist on Facebook, an informant gets to know him, spends months with him, sometimes years, says, do you want to commit an act of violence? Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't, but the informant pushes him in that direction. Sometimes the informant comes up with the idea, they give him the bomb, he goes and delivers the bomb in a car, he dials on a cell phone expecting it to blow up, and when it doesn't blow up, they arrest him, and they trot it out to the media as, look at us, we've, we've foiled another terrorism plot. And the driving force behind all of this you know, I, I think some people in this room may disagree with me, and um, and certainly there's been evidence within from within the FBI that there is is a lot of uh, bigotry and Islamophobia. So, for example, there you know have been training materials that describe the Prophet Muhammad as a cult leader and and charity among Muslims as being a front for raising money for terrorism. And, and these examples of bigotry exist within the FBI, um, and, and and they only recently pulled that that sort of training material. This is the material that that counterterrorism agents would receive. But I don't think that there's any, like Robert Mueller, the high-level executives of the FBI, are there saying, you know, we want to stick it to Muslim communities. Um, what I really think is happening is that there is a bureaucratic evil that's, that's, that's occurred. And by that, I mean Congress sets the budget for the FBI every year. And so before 9-11, the FBI's focus was mortgage fraud, organized crime, drugs, the typical areas that you would think of. And, and after 9-11, there was this overnight shift, and they moved the vast majority of the FBI's budget 
into counterterrorism. So today, the FBI gets $3 billion for counterterrorism compared to $2.5 billion for organized crime, which was before was the, the heart of its budget. And, the, and what it boils down to is there's a lot of money for counterterrorism and really not a lot of terrorists going around. And so Robert Mueller can't go back to Congress every year and say, hey, you know what? I, I spent your $3 billion and we didn't find any terrorists. Instead, he goes to Congress and says, we found terrorists. We found James Promen, the man who was caught in that tape, and doesn't tell Congress, well, you know, James had mental problems. He worked at Walmart. He didn't have access to weapons. He didn't know any terrorists. He you know, only got involved in it through the use of an informant. Instead, he tells Congress, James Cromedy was about to plot with others, or was plotting with others to bomb synagogues in the Bronx and launch Stinger missiles at um, airplanes taking off from Stewart International Air Airport. And Congress believes that. And, and as a result of that, we've had year after year an escalation in the, the counterterrorism budgets, whereas today is, is the largest amount. And what we've also seen is a move from within the FBI to what before 9-11 it would have called the dark side, which is kind of CIA tactics. After 9-11, there were a number of agents, including a man named Phil Mudd, who moved from the CIA to the FBI. And their job was to increase what's called human intelligence, which are the informants. And you know, when most people think of the FBI and the abuses of power, I think they think of J. Edgar Hoover and COINTELPRO and the terrible things that they did to civil rights organizations and infiltrating them, and they did. And we're just only now hearing about some of these things. You know, for example, we just found out that Ernest Withers, the celebrated civil rights photographer, actually was an FBI informant who was ratting on MLK's organization. But given that, at that time in the 60s, the FBI had 1,500 informants. Today they have 15,000. They have 10 times the number of informants that they had in the 1960s. In fact, they, ha they have so many informants that um, they had to ask Congress for millions of dollars more so they could create a sophisticated software program just to handle them and just to be able to move them around the country and know whose was whose. Um, and what this has done is the mixture of money and informants has, has created a system where it's built in pressures all along, and it's built in pressures from the top. So, so Robert Mueller and the executives at, at the FBI get $3 billion from Congress. They put pressures on, pressure on their field offices to find terrorism cases. They need, they've got all this money. So the field offices, in turn, put pressure on the, the local agents to find terrorism cases. Those local agents put pressure on the informants to find terrorism cases. Those informants are further incentivized by the fact that, hey, if I find a terrorist, I can make $100,000 or more. And so then they go into communities, and they go into Muslim communities around the country, including this one, and look for people who are interested in committing violence. And what they ultimately find are people that say, no, I'm not interested in committing violence. But they, all, but they do find people who say yes, and these people are the ones who are economically desperate. You know, there's a case in Seattle involving a man who had schizoaffective disorder, which means he had trouble you know, distinguishing reality and fantasy, and he was the one who was brought into a terrorist plot. And so what, what, they've, what they've effectively done is you know, imagine, I live in St. Petersburg, uh, you know, imagine that the St. Pete Police Department said, okay, we're gonna send a bunch of informants into the largely African-American South St. Pete, poor section of town, and offer money for anyone who steals a car. And when we bust those people for stealing cars, the media is gonna report how there was a rash of car theft and the St. Pete Police was there to do its job. Well, and, and, and essentially, in a way, that's what's happening in Muslim communities through the use of the FBI informants except that there isn't the level of outrage, in fact there's very little outrage, that I think we would have if that operation happened in South St. Pete. And, and, and a problem with that is that, you know, the FBI now has, like two, has always had kind of two areas to keep it in check, and, and one area has been the courts, you know, the courts can throw out these cases, and the other has been Congress. And in these cases there's almost a 100% conviction rate <coughs> for two reasons. One is that it's, it's proven almost impossible for any of these defendants to argue entrapment, um, in part because the bar to, to the, the, the Department of Justice has to overpower an entrapment defense is to say that, well, he was predisposed to commit a crime. And that predisposition can be something as simple as watching a jihadi video. Um, the other part is that these crimes often involve such horrific plots like bombing subway stations, bombing downtown skyscrapers, that for a jury, it's hard for them to kind of get over, to build empathy and sympathy when they can think, oh, well, you know, my brother works in that building or I ride that subway system. And at the same time, uh, Congress hasn't really been willing to challenge these in any significant way, in part because Congress is a, obviously a political body. It's difficult to be the guy who's weak on terrorism. So we really haven't had this, the level of criticism of these cases um, yeah, and so for that reason, the FBI has like been emboldened 
And what we've seen, you know, a lot of people like me thought, well, when Obama took office, we'd see a, a decline in these types of cases. We've actually seen an increase and a doubling down of these policies, um, a further use of agent provocateurs, um, and, and now, you know, almost universally, actually universally, men caught in sting operations under the Obama Justice Department have never had connections to international terrorists. It's always been um, an informant who provided the connection, the informant posing as an al-Qaeda operative, and then lured them into a plot. And then the other problem in these, in these cases, and I forgot, I should mention this a moment ago, is that because the FBI controls every aspect of the case, they can create these fantastical plots that will qualify these defendants for mandatory minimum sentences that are draconian in nature. So, you know, so in, in concocting a, a terrorism sting operation, the FBI could say, okay, well, you know, let's give you a gun and we're gonna send you off into the, the mall and you're gonna shoot a couple people in the knee. And you know, that'd be a that'd be terrorist act, right? But for the FBI, it's you know, go big or go home. So they say, we're gonna give you this big bomb and we're gonna put it in this truck and you're gonna drive it to the downtown building and you're gonna kill thousands of people. And, and, the, and that has two effects. One effect is it's going to overwhelm that jury. The other effect is that it's gonna qualify the defendant for mandatory minimum sentences that are decades, 25 years, life in prison at times. And the person who's in a position of saying, do I wanna to go to trial, has to face the prospect of, well, if I go to trial, I'll spend life in prison, or I could cut a deal and spend 10 years in prison. And what we're seeing more and more in, in, in about 90% of the cases is they choose to cut a deal. Um, and so what's interesting now is that we're actually getting to the point where some of the earliest cases, uh, in, it, some of the defendants involved in the earliest cases of sting operations are now reaching that seven year point where they're stuck, which is the, uh, the minimum sentence that some of them have gotten in, in plea deals, and they're starting to get out. And so these are people that seven years ago the Department of Justice had said, you know, this was a dangerous terrorist and he was going to kill innocent Americans, and now they're out of prison and they're just being released back into the community and the Department of Justice isn't saying anything about it. You know, if these are really dangerous terrorists, then you think they'd say, uh, you better be careful, there's, there's a guy in your neighborhood who was convicted of terrorism charges. Um, and actually, actually, it's so egregious, in fact, that in 2003, in a State of the Union address, George W. Bush talked about this group named, known as the Lackawanna Six, who had traveled overseas and uh, actually went to a training camp and got to the training camp and realized, you know, being a terrorist is, kind of sucks, and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go home. And so they go home, and they go back to live like normal lives, and that, then they get busted for having gone to the terrorist training camp, and uh, the, the main evidence against them was that they happened to cook in the, in the kitchen, which is providing material support to terrorism. And so George W. Bush, George w. Bush described this as a terror cell in a State of the Union address and compared it to others that were busted in, in Germany and, uh, and East, East Europe, and they're now out. You know, so in 2003, George W. Bush, a decade ago, George, George W. Bush said this was a dangerous terrorist cell, told the whole nation in the State of the Union address, and now they're out of prison and no one really says much about it. And so, you know, this actually like suggests that, you know, they weren't terrorists or that the Department of Justice feels that after a short prison sentence, terrorists can be fully rehabilitated. So I'll let you decide what that is. And then the other thing to think about, um, you know, in, in these cases, we have yet to see an example of, you know, the FBI is so concerned about the so-called lone wolf, the guy who is in his apartment and becomes inspired by Al-Qaeda and goes and commits some sort of act of terrorism. And, and what we know is that that's never happened. You know, there has yet to be that guy, except for Hassan, and it's a, it's a very different case because he was on a military base, but there has yet to be some guy, say, living in Tampa, who says, I'm gonna you know, commit some sort of act of terrorism and puts together a bomb and, and, and delivers it somewhere. And so, so that either means that the FBI is like, perfect at its job, that for 10 years it's got off the street every would-be terrorist who would ever strike the United States, or it means that the uh, threat has been overblown by the FBI, and the use of these sting operations have created an effect where it has exaggerated the threat of Islamic terrorism because these sting operations turn people into terrorists who would never be terrorists, and then the general reporting by the media, which tends to be pretty thin, um, is about how, look, we busted a terrorist and this guy was dangerous, and it leaves the community with this impression that um, Islamic terrorism is a real and dangerous threat within the United States. When, in fact, I, I, I'd like to point out that you know, more people in the last decade have been killed by you know, lone gunmen, like we saw in Colorado and Connecticut, than have been killed by you know, lone wolves with Al-Qaeda sympathies. And so, yet, yeah, we're spending billions of dollars to combat this threat that over the last decade, we can only point to five examples of. 